I'm hanging with LA Posse, which is Ganja K and uh, um, John. They're starting to evolve as MCs. You know, the guys we used to work at the sandwich shop, Ganja K. Uh, Ganja ends, ends up working at the sandwich shop. John, his partner, moved on and started working at like Radio Shack and some other stores. Um, they discovered the good life. They, you know, they were on the scene too. And, you know, they one day come to my house. They would always come to my house and we'd do our little thing. They come to my house one day and they're like, James, you gotta come. You gotta bring your beats, man. Get your beat tape and come to this place. Dude, like you go there, you sign up on the list, you get to do your music, and when it's your time, they play your beat and you can open mic rap, you know? And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, Thursdays, man. Next Thursday, we coming down, we taking you down there soon, but you know, because they was out in the world. I was like the mad scientist in the lab. I just like to be in the lab. Um, so I go with them, and man, that was another revolutionary moment. It was like seeing, that's where the first time I saw Micah Nye, AC Alone, uh, Jupiter Peace, you know. Um, and I remember Micah blowing my mind. Like, I was like, who is this dude? Like, whoa, like, okay, okay. You know, and AC kind of similar, like, okay. And Peace wasn't even in their group. He was a separate MC coming to the good life. Him too. Okay, who are these dudes? You know what I mean? And, um, you know, me and my, you know, backseat entrepreneurial self and uh, backseat mogul trying to do, create my own, oh, that's probably my back door, trying to create our, my little juice crew, so to speak, on the Marley Mall world. Um, we were trying to get our, our collective of, 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 of MCs, you know what I mean, to be solid. Um, back then, there were a lot of people making compilation tapes. And it would be like, uh, you know, and... After going to the good life for several weeks and months, you know, this week's turning into months and, you know, kind of seeing how it was evolving and growing. Like we got, when I showed up there, it had already been going, but it was blossoming. It was starting to like, now there was no seats left in the house. Now there's people standing outside. Now there's like, you know what I mean? Like industry people, you know, it just, it just started expanding and expanding. Like every week we would come, there was just more people. Like you had to come earlier. If you want to be on the list, you had to come crazy early, you know what I mean? Um, and people started to develop who were the, 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 um, the, the, um, the, the marquee people. The marquee artists were being developed. Like people knew, oh, I want to see this dude. You know, and then there were people in between, and then they were like, oh, I want to see this dude, you know. So th that was developing, and it was becoming Mike. It was becoming AC. It was becoming Peace. You know what I mean? It was becoming Red, MC Riddler, you know, Fish, Autumn Dew, CBE, Chillin' Villain, Empire. It was becoming these guys who, like, everybody's like, I want to see them. I want to see them. I want to see them. Every now and then, there were these people in the middle, and you were kind of like, eh, you know. Um, but you would, because you were seeing people weekly, you knew you got to know their catalog and their songs, and then you look forward to their songs. It was like getting to see somebody perform their same song every week, and like, oh, I want to hear him. I hope he does this song, you know. So people have favorites. People would like request stuff. You know, it, it started to become that. Like it just organically became it. Nobody said it. It just happened. Um, and my beats found their way into that because I would, you know. Keyshawn and John also became, you know, I didn't, let me say that too. Like, people wanted to hear Ganja and they wanted to hear John. They were good MCs at the same level as Mike Juven Peace, you know. Um, and so, because of that, because of Mike and Juven and them guys hearing my beat, Mike and AC and them guys came to my house one day. And I remember me and Mike hit it off. We just, I put on a beat that I had. It was just like a James Brown loop. And at this point, I, had been, I came to acquire a Casio FZ1 sampling keyboard. So I had a sampler now with a sequencer, and I could actually make beats in a more traditional fashion. Um, I got Mike in my studio on the four track, and he blew it up. And he was like, we worked. Like, it was like, if, it, if, it, if at that point, for some reason, it became like, you know, like Guru and Premiere. Mike and me could have been that. Like, that's how we hit it off so tight on that first track we ever made, you know, sight unseen. He came in, he heard the beat, he was like, ah, he busted on it. And we was like, magic, that's magic, you know. So I started kind of making beats for them. Okay, so compilation tapes were coming out. People were making compilation tapes and um, doing their thing. Um, I got the idea that I was like, you know, <laughs> this is that elite mentality that I and D had. It was like all these all these compilation tapes are whack. Bottom line. That was it. They're all whack. 
I have a compilation tape. It's in my store somewhere that has Snoop on it when he was nobody. Snoop Dogg, you know. So, I mean, all these, a lot of these people went on to be people, but, you know, it was like, but, whack, but. Snoop was actually tight back on his, let me say that. But, you know what I mean? A lot of MCs, he was just like, mm, whack, uh, uh. We could do it better. We could do it better. Like, that was always the conversation. We would have these, you know, you would think I smoked weed the way I would talk about music for, like, hours on end, but I never, you know, I just, that's how much I loved it. And that's how I expressed it. We would be on the phone for like three hours talking about, you remember when Eric B, what would happen if Marley Ball produced Eric B? We got rid of, you know, we'd be like, get rid of Eric B and have Rakim bus on Marley Mall doing, you know, we'd make these in our minds, these super compilations of like MCs, you know, and DJ partnerships. We'd be like, you know, like we didn't like Guru, but we like Premier. Like we would, you know, you like, if I could get Premier to make a beat for so-and-so, and so, you know. And that's what we consider ourselves at. Like, we consider ourselves, we're like Guru and we're like Marley Ma. And who can we partner with, you know, and do what we need to do? Um, so we said we need to make this compilation, right? Um, and I had the means to make it happen. At this point, I had moved out of my mom's. I had my own apartment in West Hollywood. I was working for one of my professors at UCLA. Every year that professor would give one student a job. I got the job the year I had his class. So I'm doing music marketing. I'm thinking I'm in the music. On, I'm on my way to moguldom in my mind, you know, and I'm doing the hip hop on the side. Like I'm, I'm, I got a, I got a career. I got good money. I got my own apartment. I got a car. I'm doing it. You know what I mean? Like I'm on my way, you know, but I wasn't in hip hop. You know, I was in music marketing, but we're marketing billboard records, like pop records, you know, so I wasn't doing hip hop. But I was in the music industry. I knew industry veterans. I knew record labels. I knew that scene. So. I was like, we got to make a compilation, man. And I know how to do it right. I know how to get to studios. I had connections from my, some of my professors from UCLA. Some of them own studios. And, you know, so I had all these people I could pull resource from. And so after um, One Day at the Good Life, I pulled the coattails of all the dudes I liked. I literally, I got Mike together. I said, dude, on this date, you guys going to come to my house up in West Hollywood and we're going to have this conversation. You know, I got Mike, Jupe, Peace, you know, Jupiter came along. Because Jupiter at the time wasn't really rapping out front. He just happened to be tight with Mike and, you know, they grew up together. So Jupiter, I didn't even really see he was an MC. I didn't even think he, I didn't, you know, I knew him because he was there, but he never was on stage much. You know what I mean? Um, peace, I liked Peace, but he was this little kid. He was, he was like 17, I think, at the time, you know. So he was kind of like this really talented, like, kid who was underage at the thing but I was like you come to my house man you get to my house can you be there on this date I invited all these select people um, they got into my living room and I said dude we need to make a compilation like here's the compilation that Project Blow made I mean not Project Blow I'm sorry I don't say that here's the compilation that the Good Life made there was a Good Life compilation tape it was called like the Good Life compilation tape and it had Big Al on it it had some you know um, uh, you know, people on it, but it wasn't the select group of people I was choosing. So I said, let's make our own. And then I, I, I laid it out. Like I literally, I, I, I had a budget. I said, this is how much it costs to press, you know, vinyl at, or, or uh, cassettes at um, Rainbow Records in Santa Monica. I knew that connecting over there. Um, you know, I knew about how to make a record. I knew how to record it. I had my little four track. I knew how to produce it. I knew how to do all the, the stuff behind the scenes. I was like, I need you guys' talents to perform on this. I'll make beats, you guys perform on this, right? Um, and they all agreed. Um, and in that same room was Ganja K and um, John, you know. Um, and he had changed his name to Ganja K and it was, um, um, I think uh, they were called The Chronic at the time too. And this is before Dr. Dre became Chronic. So, you know, I have to say that. Dr. Dre did not, he was not the first to think of The Chronic. Ganja K was the chronic, you know what I mean? It was Lieutenant uh, Bombay, Lieutenant KMC and uh, Dr. Bombay as the chronic. And they, they went on that whole shift. And I think that, that, I don't know, you know, where they got that influence, you could ask them. But um, they couldn't be on it, though, because they signed a, a deal. So that, that was an incredible void that they should have been on it because they would have been, like, first name on it, in my mind. But they couldn't be on it. They signed a record deal. And they were off and recording. They were recording in a professional studio. We would go there, you know, and that's where Torch was in that circle. Um, and, and Mean Green. Mean Green is like a good childhood friend of 
Keyshawn, Ganja K, and John. And that's how I met Green. You know, me and Green kind of hit up. And Green was trying to learn to rap. He wasn't even rapping back then. So he just tagged along. He was like the buddy hanging along. Then, it, you know, he just turned into like a superstar MC. You know, we, I don't even know how these things happen. But so anyway, we, <laughs> we, I got these guys in my house, in my house, away from all influence. And I said, here's the proposition. Here's the budget. We just need to come up with $120. We'll record these songs over the month of September 1991. And then I had a schedule a month from then. I'm going to take it. I'm going to get it mastered. I had a teacher, Moonlight Studios. These guys, we went to like, uh, um, what is it, Los Feliz kind of area. He had a little garage studio there. I said, we're going to master here. He'll do it for me for good. I'll cover it because I had a job. Like a lot of guys didn't have jobs and so forth. I said, I'll cover that. I'll cover this post-production. You know what I mean? It's just, I want you guys to chip in. And you know, and I, I even broke it down kind of like the drug game. I was like, if we each put in a 120, look what can flip back if we sell them for five bucks a piece. You know, we get 500 times five, that's $2,500 back. You know what I'm saying? So we're putting in something, it was something like 700 some dollars, whatever. We're gonna come back with 2,500, but let's not spend that 2,500. Let's re-up and let's get some vinyl. Like, let's, let's just keep unfold it, fold it, fold it, get it back, fold it, get it back, you know. And so I, I outlined this whole business proposition to the guys, and they were just word, you know what I mean? And, you know, you'd have to ask them what their motivation was to want to do it. But my motivation was we could build something. We can become our own. Like, let's not sign with the man. A record deal is a chumps game, you know what I mean? And that's what I was learning at UCLA. I was learning a record deal is not, it's for the favor of the record label. It's not for the favor of the artist. I was reading the books. I, you know, I talked to the, I, I talked to Clive Davis, like I'm talking to you. You know what I mean? Like I, I, so I was like, you don't want a record deal, dude. You don't want to be sending your demo. I had interned at record labels.